episode of Surviving the Survivor. We bring you the best guests in all of true crime. Don't forget to subscribe and smash that like button. Here's your host, Emmy Award-winning broadcaster, Joel Waldman. What's up, STS Nation, and welcome to another episode of Surviving the Survivor, the podcast that promises to bring you the very best guests in all of true crime. And today, the topic is the one that uh, it appears STS Nation most likes us to discuss and ask questions about. So once again, we are talking Donna Adelson. She's had a couple of court hearings, of course, one in Miami after her arrest trying to flee to Vietnam and then in Tallahassee. And guess what? She is due back in court on Monday, but uh, for the time being and possibly for the foreseeable future, she is a resident of Tallahassee, Florida, a place that is ironic because she wanted her grandkids so desperately to leave there. And now her son, Charlie, not far away, I think just about 30 minutes away in Wakulla, which I was calling Wakula, but I now know to call Wakulla. And uh, we are working diligently behind the scenes to try to get you a tour of the Wakulla Correctional Facility. And the man with the bovine behind him is a one person who might be able to help us get there. I already reached out to the warden and I got a basic one word answer about a, a tour there. The answer was no. And I responded, does this mean ever? Is that a permanent no? And I never heard back. So i um, going to keep working on them. I never take no for an answer the first time around. But let me introduce uh, best guests here. I hate to get myself put into a color prison just to get a tour by doing something untoured. But I've got some powerful defense attorneys that can come to my aid. Maybe it'd be worth it for one night. But Jeremy Mutz. He uh, specializes in criminal defense, family law, and divorce law. He has very strong Tallahassee ties, having attended FSU School of Law, where, of course, Dan Markell was a professor, and he also worked as an assistant state attorney, so he knows what's going on inside the SAO office, the state attorney's office. He now has a private practice in Shipley, Florida, in the panhandle. I never knew this. I had no idea, but Jeremy Mutz, even though we are in the state, same state, he is one hour behind us. So he has an extra hour today, more than I do. Uh, who knew? Uh, mm -hmm. Stephen Webster, he is one half of Stephen Webster and Louis Baptiste attorneys at law. Stephen was uh, Dan Markell's post-divorce attorney. He got the news uh, the day Dan Markell was shot and killed. And uh, I think all these years later, still trying to process all that. And last, but certainly not least, the man who is looking sporty, Preston Scott. He is the host of the morning show with Preston Scott in Tallahassee. He's lived in Tallahassee since I graduated high school in 1987, and he's hosted the show since 2002. Fun fact regarding Preston Scott, he is the son of legendary sportscaster Ray Scott. Ray Scott was a partner of Pat Summerall. They called the first two Super Bowls, and uh, Pat Summerall, obviously one of the most famous play-by-play -play guys ever. So it runs in the Scott family genes, of course. Um, Stephen Webster, is this story ever going to end? Not for me. And, you know, I uh, was thinking about it this morning. I think about it quite often. <laughs> and... You know, I really believe that the Adelsons and the people that were involved in this, they just figured, you know, murders fall through the cracks all the time. Police don't have any leads. Cases get cold and everybody forgets about it and moves on. And they underestimated just what this would do to this city and what it would mean to this city and to the law enforcement agencies that, you know, were investigating it. Um I think, you know, for those people that have been kind of carrying it around for almost 10 years and it's still raw, it makes me think it probably won't ever not be a part of my life or my conscience, you know, and because I'm partnered with Lewis, who Dan introduced me to, it's a constant reminder for the two of us about Dan and who he was as a man. So for, for me, it won't. You know, I know that um, in our fast paced society with social media and and stories you know the next story the, the 24 hour news cycle 
it may seem like that this will be forgotten, but I think this has had a profound impact on a lot of folks. I mean, the ongoing interest in the case, I think this a lot of a lot of people will carry this with them, much like maybe a Casey Anthony or, you know, just some of those those cases that stick with us the Natalie Holloway's, et cetera. And uh, really well said, and it certainly will never end for uh, Ruth Markell, Phil Markell, Shelly Markell, and of course, Ben and Lincoln and the other children, um, even the children of the bad guys. Uh, in this case, Charlie Adelson, uh, Sigfredo Garcia, Luis Rivera, uh, Katie McBanawa, all those kids are collateral damage, as they say. It is horrific. Uh, on a lighter note, um, it is Thursday. It's been a rough week, but um, if you're interested... Uh, it was quite the showdown today. This is only a Florida story. Lo and behold, at the bottom of my pool were two iguanas when Ethel, the boxer, who notices nothing, went outside and noticed these two iguanas. And Ethel is a lover of water. Uh, she was circling the pool and then incredibly, unexpectedly, she dove right in and I won't tell you what happens next, but it's fascinating and it's a tease and it's on my uh, Instagram page at surviving the survivor. Let me just leave you with it. Iguanas, crafty little creatures. I know, Preston Scott, you know that these iguanas can hang underwater for what seems like hours at a time, Preston. You must know this. No, I don't know this. And, mm -hmm. and quite candidly, I don't much care. Yeah, that's, I love it. Do you have iguanas in Tallahassee? I must know this. No, too cold up here. It gets too cold and those things freeze and die. Mm. Well, they freeze and they fall out of trees or into pools. But uh, we have tons of iguanas here. I, I happen to like them. They're creepy little fellows. But um, anyway, I learned today that they can hang underwater for literally, I think, hours at a time. Something I never knew. And the video, once again, look at this. Best post ever. Yes. Um, and it's at Surviving the Survivor. People are saying, if you don't have uh, Instagram, I'll try to post it. There's a Surviving the Survivor Facebook page. But let's get back to the business at hand. Um, Preston, what about this irony? <laughs> what about this irony? <laughs> Hang on. I'm making notes. I needed a new big story for tomorrow's show. I think please, I just got please, it. Thank you for that. Please just courtesy us. Please courtesy us. Um, Always. By the way, Preston, I hate to uh, so publicly and shamelessly ask for this, but I'm going to. I'd love to come on your show with Carm and talk about our new book, which is all about true crime and my mother's Holocaust story. So I will uh, I of course, publicly just ask you and uh, I will privately ask you and we will get it done. I think you, you will, send uh, me the details and we'll make it happen. Awesome. That's why Preston that's, is. That's like when my daughter asks if she can stay the night with her friends right in front of the friends <laughs> and the parents. And you're kind of like, uh. I have no shame. I have no shame. I think, <laughs> honestly, it's a very true, uh, very important, the most important story I've ever told on a serious note. And so I am trying to obviously get the uh, the word out there. Someone is asking if iguana tastes like chicken, and my guess would be yes, but I never <laughs> want to find out. But Preston, what about this kind of crazy irony that all Donna wanted for her sweet grandchildren were to be away from Tallahassee, and now she is tethered to Tallahassee and her son, Charlie is not very far away either. Uh, what about the irony in all of that? Uh, you could, you can chalk it up as sowing and reaping. You can chalk it up as irony. You can chalk it up as karma. There's any number of things that you could point to, uh, Joel, but you know, I, I'm just reveling in the fact that Charlie now has the opportunity to listen to me every day, not just <laughs> in the transport vehicle, but he can now, my show goes to Wakulla. It goes across many of the regions of Florida and, of course, nationally on iHeart. But, no, I mean, yeah, it is it is ironic. Um, I, I've got so many things in this that I, I can't shake past. I mean, very different from Stephen and his connection to Dan through his associate as well as just being in the legal community and so forth with Jeremy being an FSU alum, you know, I, I think for, for me, I, I, this story will end on a, from a public perspective, because I think at some point we're going to see everybody hopefully brought to justice. 
But at the same time, where it doesn't end for me is as a human being. I think of those boys. I think of the children, like you mentioned, Joel, of, of the collateral damage, if you will. And in that regard, it's not ever going to end for them, ever. And, and so the very least I think our society should demand is justice. And that's why I'm grateful for this show. I'm grateful for uh, the opportunities we've had. I took a lot of offense at what Dan Rashbaum said to you on several different occasions. Um, I, I was stunned that he came on to talk to you. I, I, I was blown away. But for Dan to think that, that we didn't have an opportunity to form an opinion based on the facts, that's just utter stupidity on his part. Because the facts were, were broadcast on a podcast nationwide called Over My Dead Body. Those recordings were used as evidence. There's, as I said multiple times on this program and on my radio show, I was a grand juror in Leon County for six months. This case is so full of circumstantial evidence beyond anything I had ever personally seen. It, uh, the only thing that surprised me is it took this long to get him into trial. And uh, for those who uh, weren't aware to what, uh, as to what Preston was alluding to at the beginning, uh, Charlie is heard on some of these jailhouse calls talking about listening to Preston's very own radio show in Tallahassee. And I told Preston, hell of a lot better for him to be listening to Preston's show than mine, because you don't know what the, uh, the Adelsons can do to you. So, uh, but he seemed to just be listening, and that's it. Um, good, good point here from Aria, beautiful name. Uh, hi, STS Nation, Joel, COE, and best guest. I thought Monday was a national holiday. It is. Uh, the Traconis trial, which we've been covering in Stanford, is not on Monday. True. Uh, but I don't know. The Donna Adelson hearing is happening. Different courts, different jurisdictions, different rules. Uh, but there will be court, as far as we know, unless they made a mistake. Uh, Phantom 6000, a uh, new friend of mine I've been emailing with. Uh, interesting background. with. And by the way, Phantom, he... Uh, He's involved in mixed martial arts. We're going to be covering the Cain Velasquez trial, a former UFC heavyweight champ um, who is going to be going to trial next week for shooting at um, his alleged daughter's uh, victimizer. It was a pedophile. Uh, he found out he shot at this person. He hit the other person. Uh, he faces a long time behind bars, but there's going to be a lot of public outpouring because of the circumstances. So we're going to follow that case. Uh, Jeremy Mutz, um, to Preston's point, he says he thinks justice will be served. It has been a very long, slow, painful, but yet meticulous road. The question everyone always wants to know, um, do you think Wendy will be indicted? Do you think Harvey will be indicted? And if so, how soon after uh, all this with Donna? Well, I think Charlie's verdict and Donna's arrest gives me a lot of hope that that may be the next step. Um, but nobody nobody can really get into the mind of Jack Campbell and Georgia Kappelman, uh, the law enforcement working behind the scenes. And I've said this before, the case that we have now or over the last couple of years is different and stronger than the case that we knew about in 2016. And you know, I have to take my hat off to law enforcement for continuing to work on this and get us more evidence. Um, it's gotten stronger because Donna and Charlie have given us more evidence the past year or so with their calls, with their behavior, their flight, their consciousness of guilt. So you can look at it in the sense that the state built up a lot of momentum in the last trial and going on to charge Donna, and that may continue. Uh, but we don't know. And I've thought in the past that they may stop with Donna because the case against Wendy is not quite as strong. Um, and I think a reasonable prosecutor could make that decision and say, you know, we've charged the, the main culprits, the most culpable people, uh, the people that there's the most evidence against. And so to me, seeing Donna arrested, it's almost like it started to close that circle that's been open and it's been sort of gaping for so long. And it's almost for me, like maybe part one or part two or part three of a book are finished. And so I almost kind of took a sigh of relief when when Donna was arrested. And, and it makes me think back to the old Winston Churchill quote that it, it's not the end, but it's maybe the end of the beginning. And um, and so I think it's a it's a really positive thing. And it may well go may well go forward. And I have to really give a lot of credit to Jack Campbell and to to Georgia Kaplan, Sarah Catherine Dugan for just continuing to work on this. 
and to, as an office, I think, come together and say, here's where the evidence is, is leading. We can make the charge against Donna. She's fixing to flee the country. Let's go ahead. And, um, you know, they've made that decision. You have to give them credit for doing it right. Um, mm -hmm. I think it is a, certainly an irony that the fa the folks that really hated Tallahassee so much and wanted, you know, everybody to be down south. I mean, it's almost like that old film noir movie, Nightmare Alley, where the, the fella you know, the biggest fear is this guy down in the hole in the carnival that that they call the geek. And he's down there almost like an animal. Um, and then this guy, you know, he's in a tuxedo. He's running all these con games. But then at the end of the movie, he he's the one down in there, you know, begging for a job. And they make him, you know, the geek in the carnival. It's kind of it's kind of like that. It's like they had such a, a plan. They, they all thought they were above the law. They all thought they were very smart, very clever. The rules don't apply to them. And we even see that to the point that they're getting on the plane. Uh, but it is how ironic that now that they're back in what they consider to be hell in, you know, North Florida somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> Fly over the uh, it's a beautiful part of the state, by the way. Uh, looks much different than down here in Miami with all these iguanas. Uh, Jeremy, uh, people don't know this, but Jeremy is also a very passionate author. Tell everyone the names of your two books and where they can be found. Uh, the first one is called The Chance I'll Take. It's on Amazon, paperback and Kindle. The second one is called Don't Call It Murder. And um, a lot of what I write about is the impact of crimes like this on victims and victims' families. And it's kind of kind of does dovetail with what we've been talking about that, you know, for a parent of somebody who's murdered, you never really get over that. And, and of course, a child of somebody that's murdered, that's a ghost in the room the rest of their life. So it's kind of uh, part of partly to answer your question and, and what you raised with, you know, will this ever be over? And uh, it may be over in the court system, but this will be a generational, this will touch multiple generations of, of people. And uh, Donna and Charlie took a chance. Uh, they took a chance uh, and it obviously didn't work out for them. Um, as we continue to go around the horn here, and I've got clips, by the way, of uh, my interview with Rashbaum because I, I want to get these guys' reaction. I think it's important to hear what he had to say and then get these experts' uh, take on all of it uh, as we move into this next phase of justice um, for Dan Markell. But Mary Binney says, uh, Joel, will we have to hear about the puzzle pieces again? Of course, that is the famous refrain, Stephen Webster, from Dan Rashbaum throughout the trial that all these puzzle pieces are going to fit together, but a jury... Uh, came back with their guilty verdict in less than three hours. However, Stephen, how um, tied into this defense theory now is Dan Rashbaum and how problematic or not problematic is that for Donna Adelson? <clears throat> well, as attorneys, you know, we're agents and there is an exception um, under the law that for admissions that agents can bind their clients with admissions. So as an attorney, if I go into a some sort of litigation and I make a representation to the court on behalf of one of my clients uh, that is material to and re related to the litigation at hand, then I'm acting as an agent and offering admissions on behalf of all of my clients. So, you know, how many of those things could could be brought up? I don't know, per se, you know, that's going to be a it's going to require some evaluation and some consideration as to whether or not they were, you know, opinions, argument, or if things were represented as truths, et cetera. But it just seems like a really clumsy issue to interject into, you know, a, a life sentence type case. Um, and I feel like that I don't see how rash bomb, can reasonably come in. Now, I agree, the evidence is different, so you can have different arguments. But the double extortion theory, they're all married to that at this point, as long as Dan Rashbaum's standing up in a courtroom or sitting at that table. And we all saw how that worked in Charlie's trial. And once again, I would like to echo what Preston was saying. You know, I listened to those, I listened to the interview as well. And that people didn't give them a chance and they didn't. First of all, I'm not a juror, so I'm allowed to formulate an opinion before I go in there. And I can base that opinion upon information that I receive and I'm able to ingest. And, you know, Charlie wants to sit on the phone calls and talk about, you know, coincidences um, 
to him, it's a coincidence that he paid one hundred and thirty eight thousand dollars to the people that murdered the person that he defined as being the worst mistake that his sister ever made on the same day that they killed um, the person that he identified as the worst mistake that he ever made. He calls that a coincidence. I don't agree. You know, a coincidence is if I have a child and they're born on my same birthday. You know, that would be a coincidence. Um, paying off the hitman in a, with a large sum of money within 24 hours of the murder, um, that's not a coincidence. That's direct evidence. And, you know, we talk about, you know, the, how much they hate Tallahassee. I would just note, I don't know that Wendy hates Tallahassee. I know she hates Hiawassee Springs, um, <laughs> wherever that is located. Um, but so, no, I mean, I think it's, I really think it handcuffs, um, and no pardon for the expression, Donna, at this point, um, with the double extortion theory, I mean, I don't know how they could possibly go in a different direction. Um, and along with all of the other taint, in my opinion, that kind of bleeds over from the first trial with Charlie. Hmm. Uh, Preston, uh, and then we're going to get to a, a plethora of video for these guys to break down. But uh, New Britain, Paulie, Wendy, I believe he meant or uh, yeah, he meant to write culprit. Uh, Wendy is the main culprit. This all happened. Uh, because of her, followed by Michelle Abbott, who says they don't seem to have much real evidence against uh, Wendy, uh, followed here by, I believe at the very least, Wendy will be detained and questioned by detectives, uh, law enforcement, followed by this. These are all back to back. Georgia will not stop until Wendy is indicted. Neither will the community of justice for Dan. It will never stop at Donna. The community will, all caps, not allow that. Wendy will be 100% indicted Preston do you agree not necessarily I'm hopeful but see this is a question I would have for Stephen and Jeremy because this is their world this is this is what they do I think sometimes we all get trapped into thinking that Wendy needs to be tried or charged let me back up charged the way that Donna and Charlie got charged and I I don't see that I don't see any evidence to support that so my question is what do you think would be the most likely kind of evidence or or the type of charge that that might fit the potential evidence they do have there is some evidence that wendy knew what was going to happen but i don't know that it was conspiratorial necessarily um it's sort of like to me with harvey harvey i, I don't know how harvey doesn't know what's going on but I don't think he's charged the way Charlie and Donna are charged. But do you think there are charges coming that would be lesser, but still implicate them? Jeremy Mutz, what do you think? I don't. I, and I just think because the charges are, that would be applicable are so limited. And I, and I think the ones that would have to be used would be conspiracy to commit murder and under principle theory to murder itself, just in the same way that Charlie and Donna were charged. Um, and I think there is evidence to support a principal theory. That's essentially the same idea as if if you and I are going to commit a bank robbery and I'm driving the car and I get the guns, I can be charged with the robbery just along with the person that actually goes in with the gun. You know, there are there is evidence that, you know, she coordinated the schedule. She tried to find out where Dan was going to be uh, that particular period of time. You know, she tried to create this smoke screen or or cover her tracks with this sort of false alibi. I'm going to go get liquor. Um, I'm driving. This is the shortcut that I take. And, and some of these things that I think are circumstantial evidence, the state would argue if they did decide to do this. Um, so I think you, you're limited to those charges. Other charges, I think that could be applicable. Otherwise, I think the statute of limitations would have run. For example, okay. you know, using a telephone uh, device to facilitate a felony, something like that. Um, I think I think we're past the statute of limitations on some of these other things. Could they string it all together? You know, they may have other evidence that we don't know about. They may have some other things from the phones uh, that they could do it. But I'm I'm with Preston. I'm like I I feel like justice uh, should probably require Wendy to be prosecuted. Whether we get there or not is is a different story. And I think you know I think we have to be careful sometimes. Um, Convicting somebody sort of in public opinion or, or in, in a book, you know, we, we can be sure if from that standpoint, but actually proving them guilty beyond a reasonable doubt is the question that the state attorney has to 
uh, be confident in before they charge somebody. And, and I don't agree that we, we just charge somebody and, and kind of let the jury sort it out. I think we need to be really sure. And, uh, you know, if they if they're really sure, I think they should go forward with it. Uh, Stephen, how about you? Do you think they're uh, to Preston's point could possibly go after Wendy and or Harvey with some sort of uh, lesser charge other than, you know, conspiracy to commit murder? And then Jared here is back saying Donna is absolutely insane to not take a deal. Um, I don't know what kind of deal that would uh, would be. But what about the first point there, uh, Stephen? I agree with everything Jeremy just said. I um, it, it's with Wendy. It seems like all the evidence was beforehand. You know, so I don't know where anything else could fall with her except for conspiracy, conspiracy if she was going to be charged, you know, which for me, you know, Jeff LaCasse said that she made the hitman comment, hitman comment to him in seriousness shortly before the murder. That gets you to a jury for sure. And in my opinion, and I find Mr. LaCasse to be very credible. I mean, if he's a smart man, if he wanted to make up lies just to hurt Wendy, he could come up with all, all sundry of lies to hurt Wendy and probably better ones than that. Um, but, you know, especially because it, there was a certain track record about this hitman comment being made routinely, which is a coincidence, again, of course, for Charlie Adelson and uh, probably for Mr. Rashbaum. But, you know, no, I agree with Jeremy. I, I don't think any other charges really make sense. Maybe with Harvey, like an after the fact and Aiden embedding, because like I was I think I'm correct that um, they drove to Charlie's house. There's some information they drove to Charlie's house after him and maybe they could try to you know, make an argument that Harvey did find out after the fact. Once again, I don't believe that. I don't believe the the restaurant conversation at the restaurant was the first time Harvey was hearing about all of this information. But no, I agree with everything Jeremy said. I think it's at this point with the way the evidence seems to look, it's going to be all or nothing with those folks, um, even if they could get around a statute of limitations issue, which Jeremy makes a great point. I just don't even really know what the charge would be uh, based upon what we have. Mm -hmm. Uh, shout out to Sander for gifting a uh, membership. Mary Binney saying, I thought Rashbaum was disrespectful to you. Um, he was also on uh, ML Ch Mentor Lawyers channel too. Uh, I've not seen that yet, but um, I don't think he was disrespectful. I think he was just uh, representing his client and uh, I'm glad that he did come on. Uh, let's go back in time to this previous hearing with Don. I'm just going to play it out with Judge Stephen Ever presiding. And it's because... She had to basically confirm and concede to all these twisted possibilities of conflicts um, that are ba that have basically been created because she's choosing Dan Rashbaum as her attorney. Let's let's watch this and get the uh, attorney's take on it. In the next few months, or do you think we're in a position to start talking trial dates? Judge, I think we'd ask for a case management sooner, maybe in uh, three weeks. Uh, I think we'll have a better idea then. Uh, the state's been working diligently with us on the discovery, um, but uh, I think we'll have a better idea in the next few weeks or so. Okay. Ms. Adelson, there is a matter that I am going to have to address with you as well concerning uh, conflicts that would be related to your counsel in this representation. I'm going to need to swear you in and take some brief testimony from you. And from there, I'll continue with the attorneys. Please raise your right hand, ma'am. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth? I do. You can lower your hand. Ms. Adelson, do you understand under the Constitution you have the right to conflict-free representation? I do. As it relates to your current attorney, Mr. Rauschbaum, representing you, you understand that he has certain duties as it relates to his prior representation with your son. Yes, Your Honor. I understand. You understand his prior duty of confidence that he must maintain under the rules of professional responsibility in some way could affect your representation. I do, Your Honor. And do you also understand in deciding whether or not to waive any conflict concerning this matter, you have the right to obtain independent counsel on that matter? I do, Your Honor. Have you been able to discuss with independent counsel whether or not you waive any conflicts as it relates to the prior representation of your son? I have, Your Honor. 
And are you, in fact, waiving any such conflicts? I am, Your Honor. There is a second issue as well as it relates to the rules of professional responsibility for attorneys. There is another prohibition within them that deals with the matter of an attorney possibly being a witness in a case. I do not know if the state would seek to call your attorney as a witness for any matter. However, you understand an attorney cannot be both advocate and witness in the same case. I understand that, Your Honor. Do you understand as well if the state attempted to call your attorney for any reason that could materially affect your defense? I understand. Do you also understand you have the right to obtain independent counsel to assist you in making the decision as to whether or not you wish to waive this conflict or even potential of conflict, I should say? Yes, I'm aware of that, Your Honor. And do you waive this potential conflict as well? I do. Mr. Rauschbaum, do you wish there to be any further inquiry as it would pertain to Lazar Lay versus State? No, Your Honor. Thank you, Ms. Adelson. That will conclude all testimony that I will need. So, Jeremy Mutz, um, that was basically the last hearing almost in, in uh, its totality. What I played it because what an absolute cluster of a mess. I mean, we're talking about Rashbaum was originally Don and Harvey's attorney. Then he becomes Charlie's attorney. Now he's back to being Donna's attorney. And then I'm going to play some sound in a little bit where Donna is heard on this quote unquote hot mic jailhouse call talking about how uh, Dan gave her advice about fleeing so he could potentially be called as a witness. Is this, I mean, have you seen sort of a spider web of potential conflicts prior to a trial the way uh, they were just laid out now by Judge Everett? Only on one or two other occasions, and it it doesn't bode well for the representation. And, and I think it's uh, something potentially that the state has to be concerned about because you, you could end up getting a conviction and then have to deal with an ineffective assistance of counsel claim uh, later on or an appellate issue later on uh, because, you know, it's all well and good now. I, as a defendant, I can waive this conflict, but then after I'm sentenced to life in prison, then I and then I go back and say, well, gee, you know, I didn't really realize that that was going to come out and, you know, these bad things were going to happen. Uh, why Donna is married to this particular attorney, I, I don't know. Um, from seeing a couple trials go adversely to the people charged, I would probably want to think of let's try something different and go with a different attorney, maybe hire somebody uh, local from the beginning. Uh, but for whatever reason, I think she has confidence in uh, Mr. Rashbaum. And I, I think he's certainly a, a good attorney, a skilled attorney. I'm not taking anything away from him there. But it's almost like, why do you seek uh, these kind of uh, issues and do the same thing again? Uh, but it could be something where she's in the back of her mind wanting to have that card to to appeal later and you know throw her attorney under the bus later with an ineffective assistance of counsel uh, claim and have another bite at the apple that may be part of the calculation that you know she and charlie would have would have thought of yeah stephen webster i wouldn't want to make that uh calculation like you know basically anticipating a possible loss just so i can you know yell out ineffective assistance of counsel but what about Stephen? to you what about this web of conflicts is it just is it a little bit much to overcome and also just to be fair they she did hire alex morris who is a tallahassee based attorney but by all accounts it seems like um dan rashbaum is the lead and my my own personal feeling and this i could be totally wrong is that uh donna can't stand being in tallahassee another second and so she wants this to go to trial as fast as possible. And the only attorney that really knows the case well enough to be able to do that for her is Dan Rashbaum. But what about this, uh, this tangled web of conflicts, uh, Stephen? Like Jeremy said, I think Dan Rashbaum is a very skilled attorney. You know, I try a lot of cases, tried one this week, tried one last week, tried one next week, tried one three weeks ago. You know, and if you're in the courtroom trying cases, 
you see an attorney and you know if they know how to try a case. Dan Rashbaum knows how to try a case. He's polished in the courtroom. Um, he didn't have any facts to work with here. And this is a mess for him, you know, the first time with Charlie. So I don't take anything away from his skills. But this to me is gross. You know, as attorneys, we have a we owe a duty of loyalty to the profession as well. You know, and we should not knowingly engage in conduct that demeans the profession or makes a mockery of the profession. And to me, that's what this does. And I'm not going to miss my words on it. That's how I feel about it. You know, I don't care. And I do believe that Donna feels comfortable with Dan. You know, I mean, probably for good reason. He's he has proven to her that he's a very smart man, very competent man. But Dan doesn't have to accept the case just because Donna wants him to. And, you know, the right to counsel, the right to choose your own counsel is a powerful fundamental right. So the court is really between a dog and a fire hydrant here because you have a defendant saying, I want this attorney. At the same time, the court knows this is a landmine of potential problems and snafus for the record that the judge has to protect. And frankly, Jeremy knows that he worked as an assistant state attorney, as did I. And as prosecutors, we take that that um, that obligation seriously as well. When we were prosecutors, you know, we felt like it was incumbent on us as well to try to protect the record. So now you have the judge in an impossible situation where he's got a client saying, I want this attorney. The judge knows that's not the best course of action for this proceeding. He knows the potential pitfalls and landmines that could arise later on. She can waive all the conflicts she wants until they arise. And then when they arise and she no longer wants to waive those conflicts, guess what's going to happen? And if that happens before trial, it's messing with the docket. It's once again, it's making a mockery of the process. And like Jeremy said, if you don't think they're going to come back and raise these issues later in an ineffective assistance of counsel claim, should she be convicted, you are fooling nobody but yourself. Every defendant does it. I mean, it's the natural progression of things. And frankly, it's going to be interesting to me when Charlie starts having those revelations while Dan is still representing mom. Because if you listen to the jail phone calls, Charlie's already talking about it. He's like, you know, Georgia was lying in her closing argument. She was making up all this stuff. Well, you know what didn't happen? Dan didn't object. And if you don't lodge a contemporaneous objection to those things, guess what you don't have? You don't have a leg to stand on on appeal. So all of those chickens are going to come home to roost, too, while presumably this representation is still going on. And I just think it's really a really bad look for our profession. And this is why it's not a tagline. Best guess, it is our reality. And uh, Preston Scott is not an attorney like myself, but uh, he plays one on the radio. So from Annie K., do you think the only way Wendy is going to be charged at any level is if Donna or Charlie turn on her um hold that question for a second i'm suspicious of this comment because it comes from sarah months just one letter off of mutz and wants to know if mutz's books are available as audiobooks are they jeremy mutz well, no re no relation that i know of but uh no they're not i've i've thought about doing that but just uh haven't taken that next step yet well he will uh after reading that comment um preston do you think that uh Donna and or Charlie flip on Wendy. I'm starting to think it's a possibility. What do you think? Oh, you're muted. Are you muted? Yeah. Go ahead, Preston. Why are we not hearing you? Hold up. We're not hearing you. Uh, that's weird. Hang on a sec. Oh, well, there it we go. The now we hear you. Muted. Yeah. There you go. Says there the host go. is unmuted your mic. It's always my mm. fault. Yeah, yeah it's always. usually me that mutes people. This is a this is turnabout. <laughs> Fair play, I guess. Um, uh, a couple things. First, I don't think so. I don't. I don't see that happening. I mean, is it possible with the amount of talking that Charlie does on the phone? Which, ironically, thirty-five hours of calls between he and Donna after his conviction and her arrest, and he never says. I didn't do it. He, I, you know, I mean, there's no, there's nothing that he even suggests that he was railroaded by bad evidence or anything. He's lamenting the fact that, that the jury of his peers weren't his peers. He's lamenting the fact that his, his attorney said that he, he'd give him a 95 on a scale of a hundred for his performance as a, as a witness. Um, and so I guess 
The only thing I, I, I want to say in response to Stephen and Jeremy is I am not under any obligation to show professional courtesy to Dan Rashbaum as they might be. Um, he may be a great attorney, but I think in Charlie's case, he was horrible. I think it was a dreadful defense. Um, no, I'm not an attorney, but I'm a pretty well-read guy. And I certainly knew this case, I think better than he did, at least from the evidence that was against his client, because his client made a fool of himself. I think his arguments were silly and, and, and I have no understanding other than what they just raised that, that Donna at some point right now is laying the groundwork to, to appeal insufficient counsel or whatever the terminology is, why she would hire him to be her main representation in this case, because I thought it was awful. Um, and you know what? If anyone was going to say it, it was Preston Scott. And uh, look, I mean, Dan Rashbaum was a very successful prosecutor. Most are because they've got deep pockets, but he is a successful uh, defense attorney. But um, I'd have to agree that it wasn't the best showing at definitely not his best trial. And I think he would uh, say that himself. But um, I do understand it is a tough job. Uh, by the way, Dwayne Harris in Detroit with a super sticker, always generous. Uh, thank you, Dwayne. Um, could, I, could I put a qualifier on yeah, mine? Steve, please do. I, please. I, I think Dan is a. I think Dan is a very skilled attorney. I thought the defense was laughable. When I heard that was the defense, I literally laughed audibly mm -hmm. out loud, and I never for a second believed that a jury was going to buy that. Now, presumably, that's not Dan's fault. You know, Charlie brought that defense to Dan. My comments on Dan was he proved to me that the guy knows his way around a courtroom and he knows how to try a case. He was making arguments that were ridiculous because that was the defense that presumably Charlie Adelson handled him, handed him. I'm just curious, Stephen, at what point does, does a defense attorney, though, look and weigh and measure? I mean, I'll just focus on one thing alone. Dolce Vita tape. If they had any evidence, we'd already be at the airport. I mean, you're the criminal defense attorney for Charlie Adelson. What do you say to him about that alone? Because that alone is a, just a remarkable admission of guilt. Once again, he had terrible facts. And to me, there was no way to rationalize, explain away, justify. You know, there was just no way to do it. And so they came up with the best they could. What was it there that he said? Well, I was saying, of course, if if they had the evidence, they would have already come and got us or whatever their cockamamie explanation was for that. But he had just, I mean, the facts were just obliterating him from the, I literally was sat, sat around with all of my friends who are very accomplished defense attorneys saying, what is the defense? What is the theory of defense? And I think Charlie, I'm going to put it on him in his mind, he landed on the only possible defense, as ludicrous as it was, that he could offer up that could answer, at least kind of answer, why he's given the hitman money. Because, you know, he, Georgia and the law enforcement, they nailed him with the stapled money. And he yeah. was, at least he was smart enough to see that. Because think about it. If he'd come into court and said, no, I'm sure lots of people staple money. Because nobody would believe those guys made that up. Um so, you know what I mean? Like they were just backed into such a corner that they they had to try to come up with something. And that was what they came up with. And I hope they stick with it because it's terrible. And I want to see them all in prison. Uh, Jeremy, Janet, this comment has come up a little bit in the chat. Now we've got to get to some of the sound, um, which uh, Preston basically suggested. He, uh, colonoscopy might be more fun than to listen to Rashbaum sound. But um, I think he said proctologist, but close enough. Uh, Janet Moorcraft here. <laughs> Uh, Wendy is free to travel. Someone was asking if Wendy was to show up at Miami International Airport today uh, with a one way ticket to Vietnam. This is obviously a hypothetical. Uh, do you think, Jeremy Mutz, that she would be stopped at this point? Would she not? Do you think they've got a flag on her passport? I would say at this point, no. Unless they have evidence, unless the state has evidence that we haven't seen yet in the public. I think they had to go on Donna because I think otherwise they were so close that their timetable had to be pushed up uh, for her to flee the country. But I think they were close enough that it was weeks away or perhaps months away from actually charging Donna regardless. So they had to go. 
I don't really see them as being that close on Wendy at the moment. So she's a free citizen. She's free to travel. Uh, she's free to go to another country at this point. And, uh, you know, I don't see them making that emergency decision uh, where she's concerned. Uh, every time I want to play a piece of sound, I come up with another question. Nikki, Coods or Cuds? I never know, but I'll go with Coods. Gifted 10 Surviving the Survivor memberships. Some people here, uh, generosity is their generosity is insane. Dwayne Harris, uh, another five uh, memberships. So thank you. These go to people uh, that do not have the wherewithal to get a uh, surviving the survivor membership. And then Kathy Rabs, uh, gift in five as well. I'm going to put up this photo. I think you guys know who this guy is. Uh, that is his latest mugshot. The irony here is it looks like he's in his dental scrubs. Um, Stephen Webster, you know the prison system pretty well, as I think Jeremy does. But what can you tell us about Wakulla? It's uh, about 30 minutes, from what I understand, outside of Tallahassee. What kind of prison is it? It used to be a uh, faith-based prison, uh, I believe, back in the day. I don't believe it is anymore. Um, I, you know, I know that there are serious. It's a you know high risk, you know high security facility. I think it's a level four facility which means that they've got some of the worst of the worst there. Actually, a, a man that my wife convicted of murder is housed there. Uh, Danny Tappan, shout out to Danny. Um, so, you know, you've got, you've got, it's a very serious facility. It's, it's way out off of uh, Woodville Highway. Um, you know, you, you know when you're riding there that you're going to a prison and they're daring you to try to escape because you would have to run through miles and miles of basically Florida, North Florida swamps. Uh, to try to get out. So it's it's a difficult prison, as we've talked about before. Preston and I were on the show before. You know, I, I want Charlie to be treated humanely and and to do his time the way that our system is supposed to be designed. And, you know, Wakulla, I think, has an overall pretty decent reputation uh, for being, a you know, there are much tougher prisons in our system uh, that, that are kind of known. Um, but, you know, prison in Florida is not a pleasure cruise, period. I mean, Charlie is, you heard, if you listen to the jail phone calls, he had already awoken to that realization that his time in the Leon County Jail was going to be some of the best days he was ever going to have um, because it was going to get dramatically worse once he got to prison. Uh, Jeremy Mutz, uh, have you been to Wakulla? Anything to add? I've been there to talk to a witness at one point years ago and you know, there's a little bit of a colorful history to it because the original faith-based program, the treatment program was sort of described pejoratively um, all around the courthouse as the we'll call a bed and breakfast program because, you know, people would kind of get sent there almost like, you know, Eglin Federal Correctional Institution is kind of seen as, you know, club fed. You know, you go there to serve a little bit of time, but it was kind of, it was kind of cushy and, you know, kind of squishy exactly what, you know, you were being incarcerated uh, uh, there. It wasn't too bad, but now it has uh, indeed become more of a general population type prison. And it is really a remote area. I mean, this is the part of the, the state where Cheryl Dunlap, uh, the murders occurred near the, in the National Forest. So you have a very uh, forested area, very remote and, uh, you know, no prisons that pleasant. But I think they probably tucked him there to maybe keep him safer, keep him away from maybe more of the gang inmates that, you know, there'd be more of them in a larger, uh, this is a small prison. There'd be more of them in a larger prison in South Florida. So maybe this is an effort to keep him safe, but uh, pretty standard facility as, as jails or prisons go. And, you know, it's, uh, it's not anything close to what he's used to with, nice restaurants and driving a Ferrari and things like that. That's for damn sure. Uh, some people were commenting on his neck. It's this picture is not great to see it, but there was a red mark on his neck, but people attributed it that to uh, crappy prison razors. Um, here's a question for uh, Stephen Webster. I'm going to get rid of this. Um, I have not looked at this. Have you read the denied appeal? Uh, Stephen Webster from February 7th, 2024 for Sigfredo, I'm thinking that he may be ready to approach Georgia to speak out. So there's things going on behind the scenes. I have not looked at that documentation of you, uh, Stephen Webster. I have not, but I will. 
I'm surprised mm -hmm. my law partner didn't tell me about it. He normally is Johnny on the spot with case law that's coming out. Uh, yeah. But I'll look forward to reading it. Okay. And, and I so will I. That could be a big momentum swing in this case. Uh, I'm going to look at that as well. And thank you for flagging on uh, flagging us on that. And we will uh, we'll let you know uh, on to some of this sound. Now, this is me asking Dan Rashbaum in the interview he did with me um, why he's doing media. He was very anti media during Charlie's um, trial. And we'll get uh, Preston's take on this. So we're going to go through these pieces of sound one by one now. Charlie's defense was uh, very important for us to keep it quiet it was very important that uh that the government not know what his defense was that was our that was our strategy and it worked um and so we took the position that we were not going to go out in the media we were not going to advocate our defense we were going to wait for trial that that was our position then and that's why we acted as we did during charlie's trial obviously donna's situation is different because there's already been a trial of an adelson um, and so the situation is different, but it was very important to us for Charlie's defense to to be one that was uh, that was revealed at trial. Preston, do you buy it as the reason or do you think he's speaking to me and uh, other people because he wants to uh, spin a PR narrative in favor of Donna Adelson? I'm, I'm going to stand on what I kind of said before. I don't know what he's thinking. I honestly don't. I mean, okay, we didn't want the state to know our defense. Charlie was going to take the stand, and it worked. Okay, it worked in that they didn't know. Okay, maybe. It worked as in it was successful. <laughs> no. Um, so I, I don't I, – again, I, I – I was floored. Joel, good on you that you got him to talk and be willing to take the questions. And I thought he fielded them um, professionally. I, I, I didn't have any issue with his tone or anything. I'm just shocked he did it. Because quite honestly, no offense to court TV or anything, but it comes off a little court TV-ish mm -hmm. to do these interviews at all. That's just my opinion, though. I mean, I can't. I, maybe I'm wrong, Stephen and Jeremy. I can't imagine either of you, as a defense attorney, if you were in that role, doing an interview with Joel on a high-profile murder case involving someone that you're is a client of yours. I don't see you doing it, Jeremy. Would you do it? Well, if you look back at the gentleman that was representing. I think it may have been Sigfredo. He went on 48 hours and all these shows and he really kind of looked at the camera and hinted like really a coy look, like wait and see, wait and see what our defense is going to be. So some attorneys at that level, it's a full package. Not only are they defending the, the client in court, they're doing public relations and they're also doing their own public relations because they're out there as a personality and that's business for the next case. Uh, would I do it? No, because I think I'd only do things that would only if it really was going to help my client. Um, and we talked about the Shannon Gardner case the other day, how much a client like that is tried in the court of public opinion. Her image is important, along with what happens in court. So some of the helpful interviews are not done in a vacuum. They get out there to potential jury pool. Um, I think the element of surprise is always important, both as a prosecutor, you want to try to preserve that if you can. As a defense attorney, you want to preserve that if you can. Um, no, I don't really think it worked, but I wonder how much of this was forced on him by his client, because it seemed like to, to me, Charlie knew the number of the video recordings. You know, he had lived with this evidence for a couple years, and I think he almost put this case together, this evidence, this defense together. Like, how do I answer every single piece of evidence and try to knock it down? Um, it's almost like if you took AI and you put all the evidence in the case and say, okay, create a defense and it hits. And, and when Charlie testified, he hit every single piece of evidence where this could have been more dangerous is if Mr. Rashbaum adopt, took a page from my cousin Vinny and tried to make it more relatable to local people. 
and, and more believable by the, the audience. And I think that's where he lost the jury by not doing the jury selection, by not having that rapport where you could almost get a lot of traction for something that doesn't make a lot of sense if the jury is with you and they, and they like you. And I think that's where, you know, uh, this could have been a lot more dangerous. This could have created a reasonable doubt and it only takes one jury. And that's, that's what it all um, is aiming towards. If you could just find one jury to believe the double extortion, you know, then maybe you force the state to do this trial again and again until they, you know, maybe want to, to throw in the towel. Jeremy, don't give any defense attorneys ideas. Now it's going to be defense by AI. That's definitely coming to a courtroom near you uh, one day soon. Preston Scott, to um, back to uh, Jeremy's point, um, you know, he said maybe Donna was pushing Dan to do this. And there's this character, Ben Graber, who came out of the woodwork and wrote an op-ed in the Tallahassee Democrat as a one-time uh, state legislator. Uh, I think he's a gynecologist. Hadn't spoken to Donna in years. Do you think? the Adelsons were propelling forward this kind of PR machine. And that's one of the reasons Dan spoke to us. Well, you tell me, I mean, you, you said you told, uh, no, Joel, you told, uh, Dan Rashbaum that Dan, this is a demented woman. Her email to Wendy about gibbers, which was the pejorative, one of many pejoratives used against Dan Markell, kind of their, they have this code thing and that would be something you can spend an hour talking about is their code language that they used as a family against Dan Markell. And I personally think they used in murdering Dan Markell as code. But the fact of the matter is you tell me, I mean, was, was, was this in any way, shape or form, his appearance on your show helpful to Donna Adelson? I would say uh, no. I would say to the contrary. But uh, Stephen Webster, let's let you weigh in. Would you have done an interview with me if you're representing uh, such a high profile client? Not under these circumstances. And, you know, and you have to be concerned about lawyers are not supposed to do anything, make any statements in public that could potentially taint a jury, a jury pool later on. And, you know, so I have I have personally I have real reservations about that. I take that admonition from the Florida bar seriously. And I believe that anytime while a case is pending, if you're out there as a lawyer giving statements, then you run the risk of violating the rules of professional conduct. But, you know, for me, I really feel like this was a Dan Rashbaum PR campaign as much as anything. I don't think he was out there trying to do anything for Donna. I think he was trying to rehab his image that, you know, in many circles, Preston's a prime example. I mean, a lot of folks feel that way and, and share the, the sentiments that Preston has shared here today. Um, and I really wonder if that's what it was more about than anything, uh, that to try to personalize himself a little bit more with, you know, with folks in Tallahassee, et cetera, and, and worldwide to try to, you know, get people to at least give Dan Rashbaum another chance, uh, based upon the opinion they formed already. Just a very quick programming note. Um, tomorrow, 1230 PM, we've got America's most respected detective, Phil Waters, solved uh worked over 400 homicides with a 93 percent uh clearance rate uh he's gonna be on with scott duffy formerly of the fbi and they're gonna be talking um adam montgomery on trial now for the murder of his own daughter a horrific story uh they're gonna break that down and then we're gonna do the uh as we do every friday the top uh true crime stories of the week as well and then monday tuesday it's all back to uh the adelson's don adelson on a quest uh, for justice for Dan Markell. Um, next thing oh, wait, I asked, did, did you say 93%? 93% clearance that's rate. Better than, that's not as good as Charlie did though on the stand, is it? No, 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 no. Charlie mm -hmm. got a 95. Yeah, yeah. Yep. <laughs> Although 93% for a homicide detective is about as high as it gets. Um, he is an amazing detective, the way he thinks about things. Um, here's the next piece of sound. Uh, this is uh, me asking, Dan, how come you seem to love Donna so deeply? You do seem to have an affinity for Donna, like you really truly care about her. Is that from a client uh, relationship, or did you know her prior to this? Uh, when did you all meet? I first met Donna and Harvey Adelson in, uh, I would say, September or October of 2016. 
I had never met, despite what people report online, I'd never met any of the Edelsons before that. The first time I met them was uh, after the probable cause affidavit was leaked by the Tallahassee Police Department. I would met them about a month or two later um, when um, it was determined that they needed that uh, that they should get representation. Uh, and that's the first time I met them. Uh, and as far as my affinity for Donna goes, it's true. And I don't know why it is. Um, it could be from the years of representing her. It could be that she has some similarities to my own mother. Um, I don't know. Um, but I definitely have an affinity for Donna that um, that I don't usually have in clients. Um, I care for her very much. Um, uh, but but I first met them in, I guess, in, uh, the fall of 2016. Do, do you speak to her every day right now? We'll, we'll get more into her in a moment. But do you I talk do. to I her speak, every day? I speak with Donna every day um, uh, now that she's in general population. Uh, and we, we've started working um, every day uh, together, yes. Has she said anything to you? And I mean this seriously about kind of the irony that she's now trapped in Tallahassee. Is she upset about this? Again, I can't comment on what she said or hasn't said, but I can say um, she's clearly not happy about being in a detention facility. Um, uh, I, I don't I don't think uh, that matters whether she's in Tallahassee or someplace else. I think she'd rather not be in Tallahassee. Preston Scott, sort of the odd uh, comment here that stands out that a lot of people emailed me about is that he compares Donna to his own mother. So people said, wow, uh, Dan Rashbaum might have uh, mommy issues. I'm not one to talk about that, but a uh, weird comparison to be made. Uh, what was your takeaway from that exchange? My immediate reaction, and I want to stress, there's a big difference between a reaction and a response, okay? Uh, so... <laughs> My my immediate reaction was, what did his mother ever do to him? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I, I mean, sir, I, I that in, in fairness to him, just, I think, I, yeah, she's she's a Brooklyn mom. Uh, Donna's a Brooklyn mom. I think that's kind of what he was getting at. I'm sure it was, but again, if, if you just look at what we know through the, the evidence of Donna and her vindictiveness the venom that courses through her personality, I wouldn't be bringing my mom up in the same sentence with Donna, even if it was just in the most surface level way. It, it, again, let's just circle back. He shouldn't have been doing your show. It just, it was bizarre. It was absolutely bizarre. And comments like that, I don't think they help him at all. Uh, Preston, do you think there's a chance that some of these comments come up during a trial from either my show or mentor lawyer show um, used by the state potentially? Well, you know, the old you've been joking about it. I, I just play an attorney when I talk about stuff. Um, I, I mean, if I were if I were Georgia Kappelman, I wouldn't. I think I would say so laser focused because I think I think the evidence they presented against Charlie is actually worse for Donna. Dan made obviously the exact opposite argument that you just made. Um, but you know, that's going to obviously have to play out in, in court. Jared here with another interesting comment, Jeremy Mutz, uh, the jury is never going to buy that. She just listened to her son and was not involved. The jury will see her words and emails and hear her voice on wires. They will not believe her in court. Do you agree with this assessment? I do. And I think, you know, her writing checks, I think her uh, feeding the strategy to Wendy, you know, all of these things that, uh, you know, it, she's not an innocent uh, bystander. She's not just giving Charlie an ear to vent. Um, you know, she's an active participant. I think I think the evidence is overwhelming. I think it it always has been. And and it. Yeah, the stapling and uh, wash well, washing the money as well. You know, it got moldy because she was washing her DNA and her fingerprints off of it. So the the money was wet, you know, and is is Mr. Rashbaum just doing the public relations? I think, you know, no matter how despicable your client is, you go on the on the shows and you say, you know, my client's innocent. You know, I, it's I'm honored to represent them. I mean, I've seen defense attorneys in the courtroom and it's, it's just a matter of personal style. 
They put their arm around the client. It is an honor. It is a privilege to represent Mr. Jones in this trial. He is innocent. And, and that's part, partly your personal style, your, your theater, you're doing everything you can for the client. Um, and then part of it touches on what maybe makes this case so scary. Maybe what makes this case so interesting to people all over the world is that people aren't just black and white as individuals. They're like it, the old movie, Anatomy of a Murder, the book. People are many things. You could have a person that you do like talking to, almost like she's your mother, yet she planned this horrible murder. And, you know, people can be normal people throughout their lives, like at law abiding. You interact with them on a daily basis. They seem like nice people, but yet for whatever reason, they're led down this path where their hubris and their arrogance and their money leads them to, to plot a murder. And I think that may be true with Donna. And I said this and some people kind of got mad at me the first day with Charlie testifying, I thought he did pretty good for himself with that, you know, elaborate effort to explain every piece of evidence and the way he came across, you know, so people can be many things. And I think it, it, it touches on that in the sense that, you know, maybe he reminds uh, him of, uh, she reminds him of, of his mother from that standpoint. And, uh, it's kind of it's kind of fright makes it more frightening to me in in a sense that somebody can kind of hide in the community for all these years and and still do something like this. Mm. Uh, this next piece of sound, two more to go, uh, and I promise we'll get through them fairly quickly. Uh, this one is the one where uh, Preston uh, said I refer to Don as demented, and that's because I am the child of a Holocaust survivor, and you've got this Jewish grandmother telling her. Uh, daughter to dress her own Jewish children up as Nazis. And so I asked Dan Rashbaum about this. Multiple examples, maybe not with Hitler Youth, but multiple examples where people show emotions in the worst possible ways in a divorce case. And listen, I'm a criminal defense lawyer, okay? Um, there's a reason why I'm not a family lawyer, because family law is the worst. You get emails like this. You get crazy emails like this that generally you don't get in a criminal defense case, right? It's because there is very little that brings out the emotions of people more than a, a vigorous divorce, a bad divorce. And so, again, if you're asking me, uh, is this email the email of a rational person? I could tell you, Donna Idelson is a rational person. Is this an email that she wrote with a lot of emotion that I'm sure she wishes she didn't say the things she said? Of course, right? Was she really going to dress them up in Hitler youth uniforms? Of course not. Does this email show that she wanted to kill Dan Markell? Of course not, right? If it did, they would have arrested her eight years earlier, right? So again, I, I get it. I, I get why you uh, want to show this email. It's the same reason why the government's going to show this email. It's their start of what they claim is her motive. I get it. If I were a prosecutor, I would show it as well. But we also have to look at the context of when the email is done, what it's responding to. And again, there's nothing about violence in the email itself. Uh, you talked about puzzle pieces, but I mean, this, this is my opinion. The puzzle pieces for Donna are, are stacked against her right now. But um, I am not T Pain, one of our amazing mods. Donna Adelson is a rational person. That is the point uh, that jumped right out at me, Stephen Webster. And T Pain says, ha ha ha, yeah, okay. Um, takes a bit of audacity, but defense attorneys have that to say she's rational. Uh, she's the mastermind by all accounts of this murder. Um, how do you think he comes across calling her rational, especially when we're talking about dressing her grandchildren up as Nazis? Yeah, there are just some statements that that no decent person would ever make. I don't care the context. So he talks about the context. And for me, all it does is prove just and truly how irrational and she was and that there was no limits to the depravity to which she was willing to sink. 
to accomplish her ends, which was getting Dan Markell out of the picture, getting those grandchildren down there where she could control them. So, you know, I, it, I, I'm, I guess, you know, if you, if you make enough money, you can go out there and try to spend something like that. But there's no spin on that ever, period. Um, to that point, Jeremy Mutz, in this email, I'm just going to read a very short part of it. Donna writes to Wendy, if you dressed your kids up in Hitler youth uniforms and brought them down here, I could care less if it was an act of defiance. And I would show gibbers, Dan Markell, that he's not in control in all caps. This sounds like a woman that is completely unhinged. I get that people get uh, temperamental and um, emotional during uh, divorce proceedings. I understand that. But this is next level crazy. Do the, do the jurors view it this way when they are shown and read this email in the courtroom? It shows motive and intent, and that's bottom line. You can you can kind of cut through um, all of what her her personal psychology is, and it just goes to uh, would somebody have the motive and the intent to actually pull the trigger in this case? And that level of of vitriol, that level of anger. And that level of hatred is is what adds up to a murder, and, and I think you could you could base your whole closing argument on on that for, as as the state, um, you know, to actually do those things, because it goes beyond a divorce. Saying I'm going to get the Grand Cherokee, I'm going to, you know, he's only going to have them on the weekends. This is a whole other level. You're going to use your children as pawns in this um, to to get an advantage in this divorce. You know, you're going to dress up um, the son of, of of a Holocaust survivor. You're going to dress up his his children as the perpetrators of, of the Holocaust. You know, and it shows the, the just the level of anger, you know, and, and what are most murders based on anger? Those are the normal emotions that a jury can understand. Why would otherwise normal people kill somebody else? You know, touches on all of those things. You know, anger, children, money, jealousy, all those things. Preston, you wanted to jump in? Oh, boy, do I ever. Um, a few things. First of all, irrational in a rational way. Let's go through the rest of that email, Joel, because in the rest of that same email, she talks about, well, let's just baptize them as mm -hmm. Christians. That doesn't mean that you're a Christian being baptized. Okay, if we want to, if 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 I concede, and I'm I'm kind of going along with Stephen and Jeremy, but I'm 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 a little bit I'm going to spin it a little differently. If we concede she's irrational in all of this, I would contend that email shows plotting, scheming, planning. Uh, it, here's a way to do it. Here's how we can achieve our goal. And while the means might seem irrational, she's showing that there's a game plan that she's willing to execute or suggest to her daughter. And, and I think that, you know, this isn't a crime of passion that often, you know, Jeremy and Stephen might have dealt with as prosecutors and maybe even as defense attorneys, uh, where something happens and in the heat of a moment. No, 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 no. This is totally different. And I look at emails like this and my mind immediately says, this woman is showing the ability to plot and to plan. She's con she's conspiring. She's planting seeds and suggesting. And and that email to me is one of the most chilling aspects that reveal Donna, maybe in irrational ways, but at the same time, fully rational. And that's I don't see her as irrational in that. I get what you mean by the emotion and just the, the bizarre nature. She doesn't see those things as bizarre. She sees those as means to justify an end. And that's all that matters to her. And so I think that email is remarkably uh, uh, revelatory in, in showing her capabilities as someone who plots and schemes. And that's a great uh, analysis, looking at it from a different perspective. And uh, no doubt, Preston Scott, you would have been a top-notch 
attorney <laughs> in Tallahassee or elsewhere. You would have. You would have been an amazing attorney. Um, I can see your mind at work in real time. Analytical bl uh, Blarney AB, friend of the show. Dear Rashi, I need you to understand that when you start something with Hitler's youth, you lose automatically. There's no excuse for hate. Uh, by the way, Donna ends the email by saying you got into this mess with the pejorative uh, gibbers uh, name by being so compliant and non-confrontational with them. So she wants her daughter to be even more confrontational. Last piece of sound, as promised, I might show you a, a hair of Donna's arrest after this. But uh, here we go. This, of course, this is actually uh, potentially the most damning piece of sound uh, because this is the so-called hot mic where... Um, by the way, Bonnie Lee Lopez in Chile, Vermont, Preston is on fire and breaking it down. But this is where Donna's call says uh, she's on the call saying that Dan basically was advising her how to get out of Dodge. Let's listen. What they're thinking up there, I don't know if we'll make it out in time. I really don't. But Dan said, you might, or you might get all of it, get to the airport, and, they'll stop it. and that could happen. It could happen. I don't know. But it's worth a try. Uh, Dan, I got to say, this doesn't look too good either, what they call a bad fact. Um, from Patreon member Bobby, is it you uh, that she is referring to? And did you have prior knowledge of her flight? So uh, I'm going to read what I've written here so I don't screw this up. Um, <laughs> so because uh, I anticipated this, this question would come. Uh, I can't talk about what I said or didn't say uh, because it's privileged. Uh, what I can say um, is that at the time Donna Adelson went to the airport, she was a free woman. What I can say is there was no indictment to anyone's knowledge. We know now there wasn't one. Um, there was no grand jury that we knew was convened. We know now it wasn't convened till after. Uh, and there was no arrest warrant that was known of. In fact, uh, we know the arrest warrant, I think, was just obtained hours before the flight. Um, uh, again, she had offered to surrender at any point in time from 2016 on. Uh, I know that because I had made, uh, that offer. Um, she did nothing wrong by going to the airport. Okay. Now I cannot tell you what I advised her, what I knew or what I didn't know, but what I can tell you for certain is that I acted within my ethical obligations. Um, and what I can tell you for certain is that no crimes were committed by her going to the airport. And that's why she wasn't charged with any sort of crimes related to that. Um, so that's that. Uh, Preston, since you're on fire, have at it. The thing that I cannot wrap my head around, and I, I never will, uh, family with all the means in the world. Uh, I've said it a million times. I would have been on a boat to Cuba, a paddle boat if I had to, and then would have taken a flight. And they bought a one-way ticket, which uh, I'm no attorney, but uh, to me it shows consciousness of guilt, no plans to come back. What do you make of that? I completely agree with you. And if you tie that together with the comments that she made to Charlie on the, on the phone line before her arrest, uh, to me it's clearly... Uh, a flight from prosecution. I, I, to me, it's abundantly clear. And I would imagine those phone calls are going to be entered as evidence. A hundred percent. Stephen Webster, um, how problematic is that call uh, potentially for Dan Rashbaum? Do you think that Georgia Kaplan actually goes for it and calls him as a potential witness in his own trial defending Donna Adelson. And what a crazy turn of events that would be. I don't think she does like, like Jeremy said earlier. Um, the problem with that is if he does become a witness in the trial, like then it, did any semblance of normalcy or, you know, of, of propriety will absolutely be eliminated. But, you know, the, the comments, she did nothing wrong by going to the airport. Um, a jury's not going to buy that. So he can try to sell that to the jury, just like he tried to sell the double extortion theory. Nobody's buying it. And, you know, the fact that she said, Dan said, you might make it, you might not make it. Yeah, technically, he, I think he's true. Correct. Technically, uh, the indictment apparently was not issued. The grand jury had not been impaneled, but clearly Dan knew something was up. And if he's telling her that, you know, rather than saying, I mean, honestly, 
I cannot give you any advice that would make it appear as though I am advising you to frustrate the processes of the court uh, in which I'm an officer of. That's the response you give to a client when they're talking that way. Not, man, I don't know. There's a probably a 70 percent chance you'll get away with it. And I hope you do. That's not the talk you have. And I'm just going to say it appears to me he talks about his written statement. You know, it. I listened to the interview and it seemed like there were several times where, you know, Dan has lawyered up. I mean, he got advice from ethics counsel. He referenced that. I think he got advice from ethics counsel on this statement that he offered. Um, I mean, so if we're at the point where the lawyer's lawyering up, maybe something's not right. That's all I would say. Uh, Jeremy Mutz, what do you put the percentage of, of chance at of Rashbaum being called as a witness while defending his client, Donna Adelson? 30%, 50%, 70%, you know the SAO. Maybe 5%. You know, Georgia doesn't want to create appellate issues. Her case is strong against Donna. Uh, she doesn't need to cloud the waters with this. Uh, this is an area, if I were in Mr. Rashbaum's shoes, uh, and I'm not in, in his shoes, but I don't know that I would have do I would have I don't know that I would do an interview just to avoid this particular subject. And I think it doesn't really help his client and, and it doesn't help him to have to sort of dance on the, the head of a pin on this issue. Um, and he may not have done anything wrong. I'm certainly not saying that, but it just kind of you don't you don't want to air certain things in the public. And I may not have have done any interviews, you know, because of that. I don't really think Georgia has to go into this, though. I think the mere fact that, like you said, she purchased a one way ticket going to Vietnam. She's checked into the extradition. Uh, of that country, they'll probably have Google searches on her devices. You know, that's going to cement it with the jury. You know, a reasonable juror is going to hear that. And, and it's pretty, pretty clear. They weren't just going to Vietnam for uh, the health benefits or the spa. They were they were going to flee jurisdiction. And uh, I think the jury is going to see that. Uh, let's not forget what ultimately happened to uh, Don Adelson. We'll watch this and then get final thoughts and call the show. Uh, this appears to have no sound. I don't uh here we go. There is no sound on this. This is just B-roll of the arrest here uh without the audio, but we see Donna of course now uh infamously yanking that phone away which was ultimately taken mm -hmm. by Pat Sanford, the FBI agent who's been working this case all these years. Uh, her bag was taken. That is her husband harvey and there you go uh getting handcuffed right there at miami international airport right behind that police officer is an entrance way to get to the airplane and to donna's right is where you give the uh, ticket to get on the plane she was right in the middle there um through the ticket agent not quite on the plane and uh she's stopped in the jetway handcuffed um, it is surreal to watch this. Uh, Preston Scott, for those who do not know, he's the host of the morning show with Preston Scott in Tallahassee. He's lived in the great city since 1987, hosted the Preston Scott show since 2002. That is 22 years. Uh, Preston Scott, um, is this a cautionary tale right here that we're watching for the rest of the Adelsons, meaning Wendy and Harvey? And at no point, we don't have the audio on this, at no point does she say, I didn't do this. I'm innocent. We never hear those words. Is that telling? I don't know how telling it is. I mean, you know, it's it. We haven't heard those words from any of them other than, you know, Wendy has made that claim, obviously, um, that she's had had nothing to do with it. Um, she's seemingly been a pretty cool customer. But, you know, I, I look at that and I, I just. I'm very anxious to see this case go to trial. She'll have her day in court. Dan Rashbaum and uh, the local council will have their day to try to defend her. Um, I'm I I have very high confidence in Georgia Kappelman's ability to present the case. And as I said a little bit earlier, I think the evidence used against Charlie is even stronger uh, when it's projected onto Donna. Because let's face it, Donna was writing checks. Donna was handing money. Donna was literally laundering money. Um, I think I, you know, 
let's just let's get this thing to trial and let's see what happens. Uh, Jeremy Mutz. Um, actually, I'm going to go to Stephen Webster first. He is one half of uh, Webster and Baptiste attorneys at law in Tallahassee. And Steve uh, was Dan Markell's post-divorce attorney. Uh, we're watching this arrest uh, again, um, Stephen. If you had a guess, when do you think this trial actually gets underway? I know uh, Donna wants it to go to trial yesterday because she wants to get the hell out of jail. But realistically, when do you think we see it uh, go to trial? I still don't believe that there's going to be a speedy trial that occurs. I know that, uh, like you, I'm sure that's what she wants and probably she's demanding. But just the way these things work, I mean, today at 10... 21 a.m. the state listed as an exhibit AT&T phone records that they discovered as evidence today. I don't know what that is, but even Dan Rashbaum is presumably going to have to dig into that. And so, you know, that's just the way these things go. I think Jeremy could tell you, you know, and the client wants it. Of course, she's out there. So, I mean, I think, you know, for, in my mind, if it went at the end of this year, I would think that that would be fast. Um, and I reasonably could see it happening in 2025. Interesting. Uh, some people are saying as soon as April, I don't know how you would do that. Uh, Dan Rashbaum alluded to that. Preston is shaking. No way, right, uh, Preston Scott? No, I don't think so. I agree completely with Stephen. Mm. Although, uh, you know, it, it seems like Georgia could try this case tomorrow if she needed oh, she to. Could. Yeah, she could. Um, we'll see what happens. Of course, again, there's a guy named Alex Morris, a Tallahassee attorney, who I think has to get uh, caught up to speed. Thank you, Jody B. Uh, that means more than you know, considering I do get plenty of hate mail if I haven't told all of you guys that. So always appreciate a nice comment. Uh, we work to do our best here and create a good environment. I hope we are succeeding at that. Uh, Jeremy Mutz, a uh, mensch, as they say here in Miami. He specializes in criminal defense, family law, divorce law. He has strong Tallahassee ties. He worked in the state attorney's office now as a private practice in Chipley, and he's got two books out. The names of the books again, Jeremy, and your final thoughts. The Chance I'll Take and Don't Call It Murder. Buy them. Uh, buy Jeremy Mutz, and they're, <laughs> they're on Amazon, and uh, really appreciate the mention of that. It's it's an honor. Um, this case, in a, in a lot of ways, it's, it's stranger than fiction, though, and it's kind of like I love classic mysteries. I love Agatha Christie, you know, witness for the prosecution. Here you have this this wonderful plot, and then you see the people destroyed by it. And I think it's very similar and seeing that, that perp walk. Um, but I think it's a slow process, but I think it's, it's a slow process to a result that I, I think is inevitable where she's concerned. And uh, I'm certainly rooting for the, the prosecution on this one. And, uh, you know, my prayers and my sympathies are with the Markell family with his two sons that are, are going to have to look at the pieces of this in ways that we can only imagine now. Uh, but they, they will be men soon who will, who will have to look at, at some of this and uh, move on with their lives and, and hopefully be men that really make a difference in the world and maybe do some things uh, that their dad didn't get to do uh, for the, for the world, for their community. Uh, thank you to another uh, amazing best guest panel. A reminder, tomorrow, 12.30 p.m. Eastern, we're talking about the Adam Montgomery horrific trial where uh, he is standing trial for the murder of his own daughter, a uh, five-year-old little Harmony, Mrs. Jim Morrison. We need Wendy arrested now. We can't wait that long. Love you, America. Love you, Tallahassee. By the way, Gambia and Uganda uh, have been in the house over the last week, so... Shout out to the global audience. We'll see you in Tallahassee, of course. And finally, justice for Dan Markell. I'll see you tomorrow.